the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegand, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heike when the Postmaster General informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heike? Thus the village of Centerville became Heike. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish, but when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Heike. Two miles west of Heike, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heike and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Grover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heike, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. Okay, we have a young lady here who is, uh, a, again, the spark plug of our organization, and she'd like to start out by uh, providing some rules and regulations that our group uh, works with throughout these years. Go right ahead, please. Good evening, all historians, and welcome to the meeting of the Greater Centerville Historians. We have a few rules, otherwise we're pretty laid back. Please raise your hand when you have information to add, and then Mr. O'Neill can come over by you. We certainly don't want to miss anything. Always state full names. Try and use full names when referring to people. Refrain from using nicknames. And please don't visit when someone is speaking because it picks up in the camera. And uh, when we pass pictures around, always pass them around so they get back to the original person again. So uh, Jerry will go around and we'll have introductions and we will have our name and uh, where we live. I'm Kathy Sixel and I live on County Trunk X on the way to School Hill. Okay, thank you. And who do you have here, please? Charlie Bauer, Highway C, Newton. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Keith Kirby, Union Road. Okay, thank you. And who do you have here? Matthias, 1018 Juniper Street, Cleveland. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? <coughs> Dillard's Crest, Cleveland. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Kathy Wagner, Cleveland. Thank you. Here we go. Joe Kress, Town of Mosul. Thank you. Right ahead, please. Walter Kress, East Cleveland. Thank you, Walter. And who do you have here, please? Rick Firestorf, Town Mimi. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? John Wiegand, Town of Centerville. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Eugene Weiser, uh, Tony Lane Road. Okay, thank you. And I'll go to the back row for a moment, and nice and loud, please. Irene Dine, Polk Lane, next into the water tower. Okay, good. <laughs> and who do we have here, please? Alice Mathias, next to Rups. Next to Rups. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try and locate that. <laughs> okay, we got another gentleman. Go right ahead, please. Rune Rupi, Town of Centerville. Thank you very much. Clarence Brookshin, Cleveland. Thank you. Virginia Brookshin, Cleveland. Thank you. And I'm going to go to the back row now, nice and loud, please. Carl Ziegler, County Trunk XX. Thank you. Melvin Yates, Cleveland and Linden Street. Okay, thank you very much. And the next person, please. Marie Boland, Township, Town of Sheboygan. Thank you. And the last person there, please. Victor Schill, Van Bula. Thank you very much. And now I'll come back. And I don't know, did I leave off with you? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and who do you have here, please? Naomi Schmidt, Elkhart Lake. Thank you. Dan Schmidt, Elkhart Lake. Very good. Ellsworth Yeager, Sheboygan. Thank you very much for coming. And who do you have here, please? Audrey Erdl, St. Nazians. Thank you, Audrey. And who do you have here, please? Janet Miller. My second home is in Haika. Oh, great. Great. <laughs> okay. And who do you have here, please? Edith Lutzi, Cleveland. Thank you, Edith. And who do you have here, please? Marie Pippert, Cleveland. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Frederick Jacoby, Manitowoc. Thank you. And here? Frederick Jacoby, Cleveland. Could you give me your first name again? Paul. Paul. Jacoby. Thank you, Paul. And Andrew, Andrew Crack, South Union Road. Thank you very much. Bonnie Crack, South Union Road. Thank you, too. And who do you have here, please? Ellen Palmeyer, County Line Road, Cleveland. Good, thank you. Nope. Palmeyer, County Line Road, Cleveland. Okay, and my name is Jerry O'Neill. I live on Range Line Road in the town of Newton, and I'm the videographer for the evening and for this uh, group. And we'd like to come back to Kathy for a little bit of uh, update on activities in the past here. Go right ahead, please. Well, we had our uh, broad fry last Saturday, and we raised some nice money. We um, raised, uh, we had over $400 was our profit after our expenses were taken off. 
And I have a picture up on the screen. I am doing a room with LTC that's going to be dedicating it to Cleveland. And they chose the bank. And the first bank meeting in their minutes was at the August Ertman Hall. And August Ertman's Hall became Wimler's. And part of Wimler's was moved from Haika Bay, but Audrey just brought something along this evening, and it says that this part was also moved. Can anybody tell me where this was moved from? And the first er uh, owner was Charles Barr. Okay, thank you. Anybody remember Charles Barr? And this was now. Okay, Charlie, can you point out a few things there? This is Joseph's. Yeah. And the Wilmers Hall is where? Is that right there? Okay. And Thomas's uh, hardware store is on across the road, right okay. there. Okay. Okay, and we are looking what direction, please? I would think we were looking west. Okay, so it's going up that hill. Up that hill. Okay. So if somebody can help me with that information, as long as we're putting it at here, we want to have correct information. And then the second uh, meeting was held at the Bayless, Bayless Brothers Hardware Store and Saloon, and that was located on the other side of the track. And if anybody has a real nice picture of that, but it's gone now, it burnt down a couple of years ago. Okay. I would appreciate it. I do have one, so. Okay. Thank you. This is what I'm looking for, for this day. <laughs> okay, after the picture we were looking at, uh, Kathy would like to uh, present somebody. Okay, this evening we have Keith Groupie, and he's the assistant fire chief, correct, uh, right. Keith? Right. And he's going to be telling, giving the history of the Cleveland Fire Department, and actually it started in Ahika as the Badger. Correct. Okay, okay. thank you. It's all a Keith. <laughs> okay. okay, we got a gentleman here who is smiling, but he won't be for long. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd like to introduce himself one more time and give us a little insight into his, uh, his days on the uh, fire Department. Go right ahead, please. My name is Keith Groupie again. I live at 12930 South Union Road. It's between County Trunk X and Double X. Okay. Um, I joined the Fire Department as a volunteer. This fall it will be 25 years ago. Okay. Um, served as a firefighter for many years. Was asked to be a captain of one of our squads. Okay. Um, two years ago, two in Two or three years ago, I don't even remember. Um, I was asked to be an assistant fire chief okay. of the fire department, and I've taken on that role. All right. So I'm here to talk about the history of the Cleveland Fire Department. All right. First thing I'd like to say is I don't claim to be the historian and know-it-all of all the history of the department. I've done some research, um, picked out a lot of pictures that we have at the firehouse. Okay, great. We have some dates, some things. Um, I'll, I will go through that, and it's my understanding, Jerry, that I'll go through these things, and if there's questions, we'll talk about those later. That is correct, thank you. Okay. Like Kathy said, it, it originally started in um, HICA as the Badger Fire Department. All right. The first thing I have is a picture of uh, Hand, it was a 29-foot hand-pulled wagon that was crafted by the gentleman from the area here. That wagon is currently at the Hall of Flame in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. It was made in 1850. Um, the Hall of Flame has a has a website and. Okay. I actually have another picture of it Okay, I'm going to pan back to that. If you could hold that for a moment, please. Okay. The bottom picture here is of actually of the wagon at the Hall of Flame okay. as it is today. Okay. Now, you mentioned the gentleman that designed or built it. Do you happen to know that gentleman's name? No, I do not. Okay. I have no idea. Okay. Thank the you. The next um, piece of equipment that I have was a pumper that was, and I don't know, Charlie, which one's going to be better. So um, Charlie, tip her down, please. Thank you. It was a hand-drawn manual pump Okay. that from 1865, and that piece of equipment is also 
located in the Hall of Flame in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. And that particular pumper was put on a rail car during the Great Chicago Fire and sent to Chicago to help fight that fire down there. Okay. So that's an, as it stood then. This, I have a picture of it from the website. It's okay, the, again, the right. lowest okay, the bottom gonna, picture here. I'm going to pan down that uh, whole page, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, it's the bottom picture here is okay. as it stands today. As it stands, great. In the Hall of Flame. Then there is one other piece of apparatus uh, that is located at, down in Phoenix, and that is, it's a hand-drawn chemical cart from 1910. Okay. And that one, Jerry, is the top. Top one? The top one here. Okay, I'll pan them all, but I'll take the start with the top. Okay. That is from 1910. Um, that, it's my understanding that there was actual, that was a, a dry chemical extinguisher similar to what you would have in your home today. Wow. Okay, thank you very much. Now, the other things that I have, um, going chronologically, in the fire department was incorporated, it was merged together, the Cleveland Fire Department and the Badger Fire Department were merged together, or I should say Centerville and Badger were merged together as the Cleveland Fire Department, and they were incorporated in 18, no, 1900. Okay, um, okay. And this is the original document. Tip it forward, please, Charlie. Thank you. Tip it ahead, please. There we go. Great. That is, that document is actually signed by the Secretary of State from the state of Wisconsin. Um, it's, it's the original. Okay. And what date was that again, please? Uh, it was, this is dated January 31st, 1899. Okay. But then the... It was actually incorporated by the time everything was done. It was 1900. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I had an article that where it talked about the first horse-drawn pumper that the department got was in 1908. Um, and that was a pumper that was driven by a gas engine. So... I've got an article here somewhere that talks about that. Uh, the next thing that I have is I've got deeds from when their property was given to the fire department. I shouldn't say given. When the fire department bought the properties uh, on the corner of Juniper and West Washington. Okay. And these documents are dated from 1912 and 1913. There's three different deeds in here. Can you show those please? Sure. Um, the first one is from, I believe it's Wagner. There's an LP Wagner. Let me go back. I'll pan that one more time, Charlie. And that one is from 1912. And then there, okay, thank you. there are two of them from 1913. Okay, I'll pan that, Charlie. The one that Charlie has is from um, Charles Wimler. Okay. And the other one is from John Mills and his wife. Okay, could you hold that key? Sure. And it's my understanding that these are the properties where the fire department was up until a year ago okay. at the corner of Juniper and, and West Washington Street. Very good. Thank you. Um, then I have some more pictures. And the first one that I have is, I believe was in 1930, when the livery in Stoltenberg store burned down. Okay, can you hold that for a moment? Yep. And this picture, I believe, is looking north. North, okay. Yep. Because you can see the old bank oh on yeah, the corner. You're right. Yeah. And then what was the, what I remember is the um, 
Crest and Cheesic Garage. Okay. And the buildings again that burnt down? Were the Stoltenberg store okay. and the livery. All right. Stable. Livery stable. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. So that was from 1930. Okay. The next document that I've got is when a fire truck, or not a truck, was, we, they had bought a Ford chassis in 1947. And this document is for actually putting the pump on that truck. Okay. From 1940, in 1948. Okay, and that was that Central Fire Truck Corporation, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, reading that? And, and the, the price on that was $4,378. That's what was due. They had an $1,800 down payment. Okay. The total price was $6,178. Oh. Okay. To put that pump and all of the piping and everything on the truck. All right. And again, that's from 1947. Um, oh, backing up one, one thing. It's my understanding that in 1941, Cleveland was called to assist at the Millersville Box Company fire. Okay. And I passed some pictures around earlier that if anybody knows if any of those are or what some of those pictures are, you know, we would appreciate the help on that too. Because I, I'm not sure if some of those pictures are from that or not. Okay. The next thing I've got from, um, I've got an annual report from 1952. Okay. It's the Cleveland Fire Department annual report. The total income... Charlie, could you hold that for... Total points? receipts <laughs> for the year were $3,569. Okay. And total expenses were... 3500 Oh, no, that's receipts. Total expenses... $884 for the year. Okay, very good. That's from 1952. Also in 1952, there was a Spring Valley Mill Spring that Valley burned Mill. down. Yes, okay. And this says on the back of it, the picture, that it's from the Spring Valley Mill. Okay. Um, and all of this kind of stuff I don't know, Charlie, are we going to hand these around after a while? Oh, or? It's in the room. Okay. Um, this is the 40, the 48 pumper that was bought okay. just a few years earlier. Okay. So that's from the Spring Valley Fire. Um, have I got another annual report from 1956. Okay. And this annual report actually has on the, the chief was Harold Wimler, president was Arno Thomas, vice president Clarence Stolzman, secretary Wilbur Casper, treasurer Lloyd Vogel, trustees were Walter Klesik, Ralph Yost, and Arno Hoon. Um, okay, great, good. So I can pass that around. That's from 56. I've got what I believe to be one of the very first um, mutual aid agreements that was signed in 1959. Okay, a mutual aid agreement, what does that mean? Mutual aid agreement is an agreement between the area fire departments that if the fire is larger than you can handle, yep. you will, other departments, other neighboring departments will come and help you. Okay. Um, this agreement was between Howard's Grove and Ada, Cleveland, Newton, and St. Nazians. Okay. And it's actually a, a two-page document that talks oh. about all the different things that, that everybody's agreeing upon. Did you read off some of the names that signed that document? Um, some of the signatures on here... Ada Fire Department was Ernst Huber as chief. Howard's Grove Fire Department was Harold Gunther. Yeah. Um, Cleveland Fire Department was Harold Wimler. Newton Fire Department, whew, I have no idea. Um, oh, yeah, 
That could, yep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, St. Asian's Fire Department, Rainbow Breckert. Yep. Town of Mimi was signed by James Driscoll, Theodore Bondi, Leslie Henschel, and signed and sealed in the presence of Carl Colt, town clerk. Okay, good. Good document. Thank you. That's from 59, um, 1960. And to the best that I can figure out, this is a mortgage okay. that was taken on the property. And I believe it was for when the firehouse was built on the corner of Juniper and West Washington. Okay. Um, it talks about, you know, the area that that it's covering. The dollar amount was $8,500. Oh, man. So this, too, was signed on the back by Clarence Witte, Harold Norfeld, Albert Jacoby, Robert Norfeld. And then in 1963, I've got the document where the mortgage was satisfied. It was paid off. That quick? That evidently. Wow. And who was that signed by again? <laughs> um, Harold Lorfeld, Hertha Witte as a witness, C.F. Heckman, Clarence Witte. Her Warfeld on the bottom. As far as, um, you know, I shouldn't be questioning at this time, but was the, was the Cleveland Bank involved with this loan, or how did that yes. work? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was a loan with the with the Cleveland State Bank. Okay. Um, the next, I've got quite a few pictures here from the Rutherford Fire in 1963. We'll look at them. Um, you want to look at each one of them, Jerry? Or? Yes. Okay. Any stories that you can tell us from your end of it as far as how the Rutherford fire was? Or? I have no idea. It was, I was there. I was three years okay. old. <laughs> we'll talk after a while, okay? <laughs> we'll just go through the pictures real quick. like and the, the fire occurred on December 23rd, 1963. Okay. All right. Thank at least you that's what it says on the back. Okay. Which Char is really scary to me. Good job, Charlie. If you can get that. the other one up there, that'd be appreciated. Okay, if you can tip it ahead just a tad. Wall. Wall. Okay. Okay, Charlie, next one if you got it. Okay. All right, thank you. Anything else there, Charlie? Yeah, that's my one. On the back of this one picture, it says Rutherford Surf Motel, $300,000. That was its worth at the time of the fire, huh? Evidently. Okay. There's a couple more. And Rutherford's location at that time was what? Tony Trunk LS and Lincoln. Lincoln, yep. Okay, and that was in what is now Heika? Right. Okay, thank you. Um, another major fire okay. that Thank I you, don't have any pictures of was the Wimler fire in 1974. I believe there's some pictures that I have in, in photo albums okay. of, of some of that, but I'm not positive on those, so we can look at those later. Okay, could you give me the location of the Wimler lo uh, building? The Wimler Fire was located on West Washington on the west side of Juniper Street. Okay. Right next to the firehouse. All right. And that was in 1974. All right, thank you. Um, backing up one step. This okay. is a picture of a, when, a new, when a new pumper was bought in 1964. Okay, just hold it there. That was a Ford, uh, Ford pumper with, uh, nope, this was the Ford. And yep, with a 500 gallon per minute pump, front mounted pump on it. Okay. 
after a while, if that picture gets around, if anybody knows the names of those people standing by that I truck, know most of them. You do? Yep. Would you want to give it a whirl? I don't know all of them. Okay, Charlie, can um, you help me with that picture? Pencil. Okay. <laughs> Tip her down, Charlie. Oh. This one is Francis Vandaloo. Yeah, slower down. Okay, that's good. Francis Schneider. Okay. Tom Kleckner. Okay. Ken Brookshin. Oh, boy, okay. Wayne Vogel. Okay. Shorty Zill. Okay. Oh, Lloyd Shorty. Vogel. Well, I'm going to back up. Oh, is that a nickname? Edward. Edward. Right. What again? Zill. Edward Zill. Yep. Good. Thank you so much. Um, Lloyd Vogel. Okay. Um, Wally Leonard. Yes. And I've been told this is a Casper. Oh, Wilbur? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, Wally Meyer. All right. Alan Stolzman. Okay. Clarence Stolzman. Yep. Loretta Wimler. Okay. This one I'm not sure of. This is Elmer Bourne. All right. And I've been told this is a, they believe it's a down. A down. Leander. Leander? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Can anybody help with that one person that... Uh, this one here? Yes. Well, you probably know. That's Clarence Brookson. He was working at the co-op. Okay. Do you know who that is? No. No? Okay. Here, I'll go take it to Clarence. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'm going to cut right here for a moment. Okay, we got a gentleman who's doing a fine job at presenting uh, the uh, Cleveland Fire Department, and he'll continue. Go right ahead, please. The next picture I have is a 1974 International. Oh, okay. That was purchased. The corn binder, as it was known. <laughs> um, this had a front-mounted 750-gallon per minute pump Ooh. on it. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Standard shift. Standard shift. Five-speed transmission, and first gear was here, and second gear was here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You drove it. I drove it. Okay. <laughs> Many times. Um, the next thing I have is was the addition that was put onto the firehouse. All right. And I believe that was put on in 1976. That's the information I was given. All right. Um, don't have any invoices for that or anything. It, it was just a chronological date okay. on things that were happening. Sure. I've got an annual report okay. from 1976. And you got, there's some, is there names listed there? There are names on here. The president was Wayne Vogel, Vice President Robert Hare, <coughs> Secretary Gary Vandaloo, Treasurer Wayne Schutte, Chief was Francis Vandaloo, Assistant Chief Lloyd Vogel, Second Assistant Chief Clarence Stolzman. Trustees were Vernon Groupie, Edward Zill, and Harvey Henschel. Okay. And the year again, please? 1976. Thank you. This next is from 1981. Um, this was a... Charlie, can you help him, please? This okay. was just a, Tip it ahead a, more. an article that was in okay. the in the one of the local papers on the members of the fire department okay um, who they are who the officers were and it gives a little history here okay on some of the some of the big fires that were fought okay. over the years if we could take all forego the top picture which has a lot of people on it but the uh, middle picture and the lo lower picture can you name some names there um, this is Bob Levin, Earl Ulrich, Jerome Yeager, and Ronnie Henschel. All right. And this is Ed Free. He was chief at the time. Wayne Schutte was okay. assistant chief. Gary Vandaloo was second assistant chief. Nick Reith was president of the firefighters. Yep. And Milton Palmeyer was secretary treasurer of the firefighters. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I've got an annual report from 1983. Okay. Things are getting a little more current. <laughs> um, this, on this annual report, President was Bob Morotic, 
All right. Vice President Marvin Miller, Secretary Mark Johnson, Treasurer Ken Stemper, and trustees were Roland Yeager, Ron Huntsman, and Curtis Meyer. Okay, good. Thank you. Also, one year before that, in 1982, is when the first responder unit was actually started in okay. Cleveland. Oh, really? Okay. Yep. So they are 20, going on 25 years oh. as well. Oh, great. Um, then I've got an article from 1984 where the Cleveland State Bank donated the money to buy our first rescue gator, it was better known as the Jaws of Life. Okay. They donated $9,300 for us to buy the gator, the cutters, and airbags okay. for rescuing uh, vehicles or lifts. Sure. Could you tell me the name of the people in the picture? Um, Charlie Cole from the bank. Okay. And Ed Free was the chief okay. at the time. All right, good. That was 1984, right? 1988 is when we bought our Pierce <coughs> pumper. Okay. Um, this pump has a capacity to, to pump 1,250 gallons a minute. <laughs> it went from a front-mounted pump to a midship pump. They okay. call it a midship <coughs> pump because the, the pump is actually located in the middle of the truck. Okay. We still have this truck today. All right. It is still our main attack truck. Okay. Any fire, this is the first truck that leaves the scene, or it leaves the firehouse. All right. Thank you. That was an article that was in the paper. This is a picture that was taken at the time. All right. I see a number of Local folk, perhaps, there? Yep. Could you name a few of those? Um, Ed Price, okay. Wayne Schutte, Jerome Yeager, Richard Zill, Milton Palmeyer, and Max McCulley. Okay. Very good. Um, in 1993, there was the Cleveland Fire Department's again received a donation from the Cleveland State Bank to purchase a rescue squad. It was a used um, rescue squad. Dan Grease at the time was the captain of our first responders. It was purchased from, or it, yeah, it was purchased from Blue Cross Ambulance up in uh, Oshkosh. Okay. Um, Fox Valley area. And you're saying? And it, this is just a press release from that time. Okay, can you just hold that for a moment? Sure. And that was a donation from the Cleveland Bank to there, purchase that? There was a $5,000 donation okay. toward the purchase. Toward the purchase. I, don't, I, don't, I honestly don't remember how much it cost or if that was the whole thing. Okay. Do you remember, Mill? <laughs> it wasn't. I don't think so either. Okay, very good. As far as documents, that's about all the documents that I have. The only other thing I wanted to share with everyone was um, the cost of outfitting a firefighter today. Oh, great. <laughs> um, this shows cost, cost of a helmet Yes, sir. is $300. Cost for the turnout jacket alone is $800. Uh, breathing apparatus, the, the air bottles that we carry on our backs and with the face piece and everything is four thousand dollars. Gloves are ninety dollars a pair, pants are six hundred dollars, boots are two hundred and fifty bucks. Total cost to outfit a firefighter today is over six thousand dollars wow. for one firefighter. So it's amazing the cost increases that we've occurred have yep. occurred. Yep. I do have more pictures, um, including fires from um, the Sukkawati fire, and which, what farm burned with that milk? Was it Han? 
Yeah. yeah. That, that Hans if fire. you got some pictures there, let's take a look you at them. You want to take a look at them? Sure. We'll have some conversation on those things. Okay. Thank you. Charlie, can you tip her forward? Okay, no. The, the fire started at the Ned Han residence, I believe. It's Okay, the, this is the fire we're looking at. Is what fire now? Um, Han. The Han? Ned Han fire. Okay. And that's a barn building? That's going? a barn fire. Okay, and you got a story to tell? And there, it started at that place. There were so many ashes and embers and things flying that it started the neighbor's barn on fire, which was Ted Sukawati's barn. Oh my gosh. Which is, how far away is it? Three tenths of a mile? Yeah. I would say about. Okay. Three tenths of a mile. And that barn was completely destroyed as well. Okay. Here's a couple more pictures. Boy, there was some heat there. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Major heat. And major Ooh. smoke. Yes, yes. Oh, man. Very impressive pictures. Wow. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you. Any animals? Oh, I couldn't tell you if there was animal loss or not. I wouldn't know. That was before my day. Um, these, uh, some of these are unidentified. I'll go to a few more pictures that I know. This, these pictures are all from the Spring Valley Fire and um, the Cyclone. No, not the, the tavern. Oh, the tavern. Oh. Victor Myers. Victor Myers Tavern. Yep. Okay. Well, okay, I'm going to pan down, Charlie. That would have been in 1983, I believe. Oh. Well, she was going, too, huh? Oh, yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. And then there's... Um, more pictures here. There's more pictures from that fire, but these are probably some of the most impressive pictures. This is from the Held Ballroom fire. That would be Steggy's. What was Steggy's? What was Steggy's? What was tourist tourist in the yes. that? Yep. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh. And that fire occurred on December 23rd, 1983. Okay. And it didn't click with me until we were looking at the dates of the Rutherford fire mm -hmm. that that one was also on December 23rd, 1963. Okay. So oh. it was 20 years later. Yes. Oh, oh. Held's Ballroom fire burn. Or Held's Ballroom burn. Yeah. Thank you very much for bringing those along. Um, I have fires from our most recent fire. Okay. The U Paper Box Company. Oh, yes. Which was not even two weeks ago. Okay, and that originally was a, a for more familiar name? The Canning Factory. Oh, okay. So. Cleveland County. On the corner of what's now North Avenue and Hazel Street. Okay. I've got about a dozen pictures. We don't need to look at all of them. Whatever um, shows up the best. There's major heat. Wow. <laughs> oh. I am surprised. Wow. Excellent. Ooh. Here's one more. Okay. Where you got that one? I'll hold. My goodness. That is amazing pictures. Yeah. Whoa. Very good. Thank you. Now, I I did most of this stuff chronologically as I was going through some of the papers here. I found a couple of other things. Um, one was, it, it's a constitution and bylaws for the Cleveland Fire Department. Okay. There is no date on it, so I'm not sure how old it is. But uh -huh. it's pretty old because in the back of it, it talks about salaries. The president's salary is no salary. The vice president's salary is no salary. <laughs> <laughs> the secretary got $10 per year. The treasurer got no salary. And the fire chief got $25 per year, plus 15% of all insurance refunds collected. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty dated. <laughs> Obviously, they've been revised since this time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing that along. <laughs> and the other thing that I've got is we've got a picture of it, yes. but this is a little ribbon okay. for a picnic that was held celebrating the Cleveland Fire Department's 10-year anniversary. 
uh, wow. September 5th, 1909. Wow. So that was a 10-year anniversary there. Yep. Okay. Very good. Thanks for bringing that also. And that is really pretty much all that I have. Okay. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions or... I'll ask know. one quick one if you don't mind right away. Is that sure. uh, when? How old were you when you did volunteer for this department? I was <coughs> 22 years old. Okay. Okay. And so now everybody knows I'm 47, right? <laughs> 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 and average-wise, the number of people that uh, man this fire uh, unit? Right now, since I've belonged, um, we have room on the roster for 36 firefighters. Okay. And um, 20 first responders. Wow. Um, there are currently 30 two firefighters and I believe there's 14 first responders okay. on the units right now. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the cost of the suits to uh, safeguard you, your safeties or mm -hmm. as far as fire and heat. Uh, is there any obligation from the people that volunteer for payment to be part of this group and to uh, purchase some of these things or not? No. Okay. No, the, we are not. We do not need to purchase any of the equipment ourselves. Okay. The only thing that's required is that you be a member of the Cleveland Fire Department, which make, means you have to pay dues. Um, for years, it was five dollars. We increased it to ten dollars per year. Okay. Which anyone that is in our fire district is eligible to belong to the fire department, and okay. basically by paying your dues and by paying your dues, you have a right to vote at any of our regular meetings, okay. which are held on the first of each month, okay. uh, first Monday of each month. All right. Your duties as far as assistant? My duties as assistant fire chief. Um, when the chief's not there, I need to be there. Okay. Um, we need to make some quick decisions on when we roll up to a fire scene, are we going to attack this fire from an, a defensive or an offensive mode. And by that, I mean defensive, are we just going to attack it from the outside? Is the, is the fire too strong and too big to risk anyone going into the building? Mm -hmm. Or is the fire small enough that we can s actually send someone into the building? And we need to make that call probably within the first minute that we're at the scene. Okay. Um, we need to organize people. We need to be sure that everyone is accounted for that's at the scene. Okay. Uh, firefighter safety is our top priority. Okay. Um, we, the last thing we need at a fire scene is another uh, or any firefighter getting hurt. Um, if there are people in the building, they are already at risk. We don't need to put, put more people at risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Okay, I guess uh, I'll go back to Kathy if we would take a break at this point and go from there. All right. Would that be workable? Sure, that's workable. Okay, i got to thank you, sir, for a wonderful presentation. You're welcome. And we'll bombard you with questions, I'm sure. So All right. I'll, I'll leave Kathy, tell us what we're about to do at this point. Right now we'll have a break, uh, five, is it five minutes or five ten minutes? minutes? Five, five minutes. Five minute break. <laughs> yep. Okay. So. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, go right ahead, sir. Alvin Yaney. Thank you. And I want to make a correction on that fire where Sugawati's barn burned. It was aiming, and that barn was between Khan and Sugawati. Okay. And it was a terrible windy day, and it was awful dry. Okay. And I remember they had Cleveland had a bunch of new hoses, and they burned through. They burned through the hoses. The sparks came on, that, and it, it was flooding. And it burnt, and it, I think it was three 50 foot pieces of new hose that it burned up that day. Wow. Very good, Nolan. Thank you so much for a good thought there, sir. We got a gentleman has his hand up. He has a question or perhaps some answers. Um, John Wiegand, I just want to refute a little bit of what Melvin Yenick said. The barn was the Yamekin barn, but <coughs> Ned Hahn was the owner at the time. He had purchased that barn. Okay. And that's where it started. Uh, they were somebody else was putting hay in there, and there was the fire started, and 
Okay. And then it went to the Sikawati barn. But actually, Ned Hahn was the owner at that time. All right. P had purchased it from Amy Hinn. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that <coughs> insert there. Okay, and would you identify yourself and where you're from, please? Uh, Richard Wiegand. Um, I'm sorry I'm late, but I was in Madison today. And um, from originally from Town Centerville, and still think I'm from Town Centerville, but I live in Spooner. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us, sir. Okay, we've got a gentleman here. We're going to be pointing out some pictures. Go right ahead, please. Charlie Bauer. And the photograph we have here up on the screen and the one we have here, it's the first firehouse in Haika, and that would be this building in here. And I believe the tower alongside would be where the bell was, and they <coughs> rang the bell when they needed the volunteer firemen to come to the firehouse. And it was located, looks like right down by the dam. And that's about all I know about this photograph. <laughs> okay. Uh, Wally, can you help us out with this? Um, you got a gentleman who will identify himself, please. Go right ahead. Walter Chris. You want to know about the building? Yes, sir. That must be the first firehouse. You got the second one was narrower and longer. Okay, the first firehouse. Okay. First firehouse. It used to be the dam and the feed mill. All right. That uh, I noticed that smokestack behind the building. What? Was that for? Steam. For oh, is running a boiler? For running a boiler for power. For, uh, for power the, the for the. The brick building was a, f a mill for flour. Okay. Mill flour. All right. Did you work there? Yes, I did. Okay. And what years did you work there? 1937, 38. Okay. All right. And That's when you went to diesel power. Oh. Right. Running feed. Okay. Now, the fire station, did you belong to uh, that fire group at all? Way at the end, yes. You it was did? was one meeting before oh. he disbanded. Okay. And what year, can you remember what that was? Oh, 1946. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, this gentleman is uh, going to indicate uh, the present fire equipment that, was, that he recalls is now located where, please? In the fire museum in Phoenix. Okay. Did you did you have to work with that that equipment at that time? Not then anymore. Okay. But we did before that. Oh, okay. That chemical pumper we have. I was along when we shot that off once. A chemical pumper. A chemical pumper. Okay. How did that work? The drum tipped the drum into a soda and acid. Created the pressure. Really? So you tip the this tipped was separated drum. before and you tip tipped it over. The drum. Because the soda and the acid got together and yes. caused pressure and squirted out the water. That's how you push the water out of push the hose. The water out. Wow. And that hand pumper that was in there? Yep. My dad drove that in a nineteen thirty five dam picnic. Okay. Okay. The dam picnic. The huh? dam picnic. <laughs> <laughs> I caught that. I caught that. <laughs> Very good, Wally. Thank you so much. Thank you. Got a gentleman who had his hand up, go right ahead, please. I'm Fred Jacoby and I've got a, a question. And that involves um, what was maybe the first or very early uh, uh, fire truck when I was a little kid. I'm thinking from the 20s. If, is there might be a record, or does anyone remember the name of the fire truck and what year they might have bought that? That's the, and I think that was the truck that was used until they bought the white Ford in 47 or 48. Okay. So you want to know about that fire yeah, truck? The, uh, what the name of it was, I have an idea, and I don't want to say it because then that affects people's thinking. Okay. And and what year, perhaps. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Or we got a question on the floor pertaining to a fire truck back in the maybe 1920s. This gentleman will identify himself and tell us about it. Walter Caress. The first truck that they purchased was 1928 Peter Perch. And, uh, William Capel was the fire chief at that time. Okay. He used to go down to the lake and they'd squirt with that. They had big picnics with that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And uh, now, was your dad, uh, was he involved with that truck? No, my too? dad was not involved with it. Oh, okay, part. okay. And again? He was with the Centerville one. Okay. But not the Cleveland one. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Good job, Wally. I have a gentleman here who has a few things to add to the list of uh, information. Go right ahead, please. Um, again, I wanted Keith Ruby. Oh, there we go. Thank you. And I just wanted to list the fire chiefs that are recorded. Okay, um, great. I've got an article that says that the first fire chief is not recorded but available for the following names of the chiefs. 
William Tapel, Harold Wimler, Clarence Stolzman, Francis Vandeloo, Ed Free, Wayne Schutte, Marvin Miller, Max McCauley, and Ron Zastro. Okay. So those are the chiefs as they've been recorded in the past. I, if someone knows anything different, let us know. Okay. The other thing is I've got a okay. whole group of pictures, and I don't know if you're going to be able to get this or not, Jerry. Okay, this you um, have to, I'll tell you what, lean it ahead. Okay. And I'll start on Charlie's side, if that's and okay. All of those pictures on the left-hand side, Yes, sir. I do not know where they're from. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so if anybody can help with any of those, that would be great. Yeah, the pictures are excellent. Okay, um, I'm just going to pan that, down. This one. Just one moment, okay. Okay, fellas. Okay, I'm going to pan over to the, the center. Next row. There we go, thank you. This is what currently houses the hearse for Stoltenberg's funeral chapel. Really? Yep. And that was one of the firehouses. I, I do not know where it stood when it was the firehouse. Okay. Maybe someone else could answer that question. Okay, great. We, we got good people here. They'll do it. Um, this okay. is Harold Wimler. Okay, wait a minute. I'm coming down to it. Okay, gotcha. I'm not sure the date on that either. Okay, and the gentleman that's talking to Mr. Wimler? I'm not sure. All right, that's fine. No, you, uh, are we going where? Bottom. Oh, yep. Is the Rutherford fire? Okay. And panning to the right. Yes, sir. That is also the Rutherford fire. All right. And then you might want to go back up to the top of this row. Very top. I'll move up there just one moment. Thank you. This is when the cistern was put in under the firehouse on the corner of Juniper and Washington. Okay, are, um, are you saying that that cistern is below the immediate building? Right. There's oh. a cistern below that. What used to be the duck pond. Okay. The ice skating pond. That, yeah. There, there was a cistern built, a 30,000-gallon cistern. Okay. Under that building. <coughs> Pardon me. And at the, after the cistern was built, there was a pump house put on to that so that they could pump the water out of the cistern. Okay. And I'm not sure what year this was either, but the firehouse was then built in like 1960 over the top of that pump house and over the sister. Oh, okay. Which, to my knowledge, was many years later. Or not many, but some years later. Okay. Um, Next picture below that? That is also a picture, that's a picture of a duck pond, I guess. The original duck pond. Yep. And the building behind, can anybody identify that? That's the firehouse. That's the firehouse. This is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And this picture looks to me like when the walls were being put up on the firehouse. Okay. I'll pan up to the top of the next one. Here again, I... That's the Volga Lumber Company burned to the time. Volga Lumber Company. Okay, that burnt down, okay. No, no it didn't burn down, there was a fire. Fire, it's okay. Still. You can see. If yeah. you can tip that panel ahead just a tad, a little bit more, please. Uh, one more move. Somewhere, I'm getting that. Just one second. Okay, uh, cameraman got a bad angle here with the reflections. We got it squared away. Go right ahead, please. I'm at the top. These were the Vogel Lumber Company fire, okay. I believe. All right. And what street was that on again, please? Hickory. Was mm -hmm. that on Hickory? Yep. Okay. Any year anybody can put on that? I can't. No. Okay. And the picture below with the vehicle? Don't know. Just an interesting picture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then Good. this, I don't know which truck is that. That's a Ford. That's the Ford? 48, 47 Ford? 48. 48? Okay. This gentleman here, could this be Arnie Stock? No, that's Harold Wimler. That's Harold Wimler. That's Harold Wimler. Wimler. Okay. Okay. And I don't know who he's talking to. All but right. if anybody can help us out with then we'd appreciate some it, yeah. of these pictures. Yeah. Good. Thank you for bringing it. That was down at the fire station? Yeah. Thank you for bringing it along, sir. Go right ahead, please. Melvin Yates, and this was the fire on our farm. Uh, they had a tank there, and 
pickup trucks brought 50 ga uh, 250 gallons and dumped them in there, and that's where the fire truck sucked them out. Okay, so you, you, they brought that to a, a central tank, if you will, and then the fire trucks had their hose in that tank. Right. Okay. And this next one was, I was dumping it by getting a truck back to the tank, and this was underneath that old tree east of the house. Okay, that's at your farm yet, Melvin? Yes. Okay. And this bottom picture is where Willard is standing in the vestibule between the barn and the milk house. Okay. That's Willard Matthias? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Melvin. And your farm, where was it located, please? 1400 some Union Road. Okay. Thank you very much. We have a larger picture of, uh, of one we had looked at before, and uh, Melvin is just holding it up there so I can get it as a record. Okay, again, thank you, Melvin, for all your help. That was October 1st, 1950. Okay, great job. Thank you. Okay, got a gentleman here who is an important part of the volunteer group uh, here in Cleveland. Go right ahead, please. Milton Palmer, firefighter. I uh, started in approximately 1964. Okay. And I was in about 30 years or so. 30 years. And, uh, My hat's off to you, sir. <clears throat> Good job. And uh, I held uh, secretary of treasurer for a number of years. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, during my, my uh, term, I uh, was a captain. Okay. And uh, also a assistant chief. Uh, wow. For uh, when uh, Marvin, Marvin, uh, what's his name? Miller. Marvin Miller was on. He was your chief, and then you were assistant chief? Yeah. How many assistants does the chief have? One? Just one. Okay. And uh, do you recall any uh, unique fires or uh, unusual fires that you had to attend? Well, we had uh, the ballroom was a huge fire. That's the helm or tourist inn? Or, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you remember the year again of that? No. 83. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when you arrived at the scene, what was your vision at that time? Huge ball of fire. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, we had parked our truck quite a ways away from the fire. Okay. And it was such a terrific heat that the bubble stopped, uh, stopped rotating. Really? Yeah. Holy man. And, uh, Actually, it was pretty close to a hydrant. We had the truck hooked up yep. to a hydrant. So okay, all right. Yeah. And by the way, I don't want to interrupt, but the location of this particular uh, uh, where the fire took place, was that like in St. Wendell? Do you call that St. Wendell yes, area? Okay. Wendell. What time of day was that? Well, it was uh, evening. Uh, gee, I don't know. It's quite dark. Oh. Help me out there. Uh, that was early in the morning, wasn't it? Was it morning? I think it was early in the morning. It was like five, five, five or five. Oh my gosh. He says five o'clock in the morning. Okay. Yeah. Well, a little dark. <laughs> <laughs> a little dark. Now, as an assistant, do you get a special fire ring code in your on your phone, or how do you get called to get to this fire? Well, we all had uh, pagers. Okay. We uh, were 36 and at the time I was in, and we all carried pagers. Okay. And I had, uh, uh, actually we had radios besides. The chief and the assistant chief had had uh, radios all right. that could talk to one another. All right. And, uh, but the calling uh, was pager and, and the radio. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time you're getting called, is the sirens going off in the village? Well, yes, it's it's sent into Manitowoc County, and they they uh, dismiss the the call for it. Okay. And uh, your duty is to make uh, tracks for the fire station. Yes, we uh, at that time we had to go down to the fire station and make sure that the trucks had enough people. Okay. To run them. Okay. 
Okay, you're at, I'll say this, if you're at the fire station, you're there and prompt, uh, how far away did you live, by the way, from the fire station? About five miles. Five miles. So now you got there and you have to wait for a certain number of crew to man this particular truck that's going to go out. Right. They, okay. They need to have, every truck needs to be uh, a driver and uh, so many men to go with it before it okay. left. Are these men, even though they're volunteers, are they, as they call, cross-trained that if uh, that they can run any part of that truck? We had, most of our guys were were uh, eligible to run the unit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, as far as when you arrive on the scene, you saw a lot of a ball of fire. And I think somebody mentioned, was it Keith or whoever? said you go into a defensive or of offensive mode, what did you do? Well, at the hellfire? Yes. Uh, well, we, uh, we kind of assessed it. It, it, was, it was pretty hot, and uh, we needed to stay back. Ed, Ed Free was uh, chief at that time, right? And uh, we needed to stay back uh, because uh, such a terrific heat okay. that it would burn your yes, units right, and whatever. Right. But uh, <clears throat> I another thing I can remember about that, I was that close to the building that the varnish on the dance floor yes. uh, started burning and the ball was about six feet and it kept rolling. It started uh -oh. on that end, really? and it rolled across the floor until it hit that tavern here, and it kind of exploded. And oh my God! We had big problems. Wow, that baby was hot. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did you, uh, by any chance, have any memory of that building on your own, say a wedding or uh, things like that, or you did you have a reception there? Yeah. <laughs> you did. Okay. Yes. You got married and. You had a reception at this particular place, and that was under what name at that time? Stegi had it okay. at the time I got married. At the time you got married? Yes. And you had your first dance together and everything, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, had, I was able to, I went roller skating there when I oh, was Oh, yes, eight. yes. Okay. <coughs> 12, good. 14 years old. Okay, good. We used to go roller skating there all the time. Yeah. And there were a lot of kids from the area that uh, came yes. uh, quite often. So. Okay. Well, you had a sort of a sorrowful moment there when the thing was burning in front of you like that, I'm sure. Well, there was lots of memories from yes, my there was. lifetime. Very yes. good. Well, thank you, Milton, for sharing yeah. those, okay? Sure. Thank you. The young lady has uh, put her hand up for a question. Go right ahead, please. My name is Kathy Sixel, and I want to know, um, you have all these photos. Who carries a camera that you can capture this all? <laughs> is one person assigned to that? And that the camera doesn't melt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good, question. Good question, Kathy. We'll get a gentleman that knows. Okay. I'm Larry Mathias. Yes, sir. I'm a member of the Cleveland Fire Department since 1946. Okay, great. And uh, if you want whatever you want to know, I, I know about it. Okay. <laughs> I've been around that firehouse since I was a kid. And when I came out of the service, Mr. Wimbler came over and he says, Willard, we need firemen. Okay. My brother was already a fireman, so then I joined too. But we, we had a, a problem. We made cheese and bottled milk and ah. during the day. And the first one that got out of there got the to go to the fire. The other one had to stay home. <laughs> so um, that's one thing we had to always uh, work with. But I'm going to interrupt one time. Yes. You said Mrs. Wimmer. Uh, how was she Mr. related Wimmer. to the... He was the fire chief. Her husband was the no, fire chief? Mr. Wimmer. He was the fire chief. Okay. All right. And he came over and asked if I wouldn't join the fire department. I see. Thank you for correcting okay. me. And they want to know about this picture that's on the screen there right okay. now. Okay. I'm going to let you show me that picture okay. and let the other folks see it okay we see it uh you see yes sir 
And uh, over here, there's a little door that goes up, go upstairs. Yeah. And, and that's where we had our meetings and our lunch break. Okay. And then you'd come out the outside door, okay? Okay. When they had voting for the town of Centerville, that's where they would go up and okay. come down the other way. And the guys were up there. There's a little potbelly stove upstairs there. Okay. And and uh, there we had one fire truck in there, a Pierce it was. That. All right. And uh, later on we've got we got uh, 48 Ford truck. Okay. And uh, now we're modern. We got a modern. new truck. Okay. And so uh, now when we go to the parade, we got two trucks to wash. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way they do it now. They've got how many trucks to wash before they go on the parade? Yeah. Six trucks. <laughs> Six yeah. trucks. Now I got to ask a question. In the past. Did they always buy maybe a used piece of equipment from someplace else, or did they always buy new? Well, first we bought this, um, the Pierce they bought, that's new, and the Ford truck was brand new. Okay. And then later on we bought a, a tanker, which, okay. the, the water tanker, which came from our dairy oh. that we used in case the way company didn't come to pick up the way. We had this truck that we could pump, take the way out and spread it on a farmer's field. And, okay. And we had that uh, truck, and after we uh, were, didn't have it, didn't need it no more, then uh, the fire department took it. So now we got oh. three trucks. Okay. Okay. And so that was a big help because before that we had these 250 uh, gallon tanks where if there was a major fire, like on Mr. Uh, Yenix farm there. Yes. Then uh, Mrs. Wimler would call all the uh, people that had pickup trucks, and they would come okay. and pump water out of the out of the uh, no out of the uh, we didn't have a sister. We had the uh, ice pond there, the Hold skating on. pond. The skating pond that was a reservoir for that you. That was our reservoir. They pumped the water out of there, and and then uh, they would bring it out to us to the fire. Okay. But uh, by the time they got there, the 250 gallons was maybe 200 left. The rest was on the road. Still <laughs> Good and, one. Good one. And <laughs> when uh, Mr. Yannick, I, I can remember, I think, every fire, major fire that we had, because you put so much effort in them. Okay. And uh, like Mr. Yannick's farm at uh, that time, we got there, and uh, Arnold Thomas was driving the truck, and... Um, Roland and Ralph Yost and myself, we had the, we had 500 gallons of water, and we had the fire started on the west side of the, of the barn, and we thought we could knock it out right away. We went in there with our big hose and we yeah. gave it all we had. Okay. And by the time we shot it in there, it exploded on us. Really? And fire flew from one end of the barn to the other. And we're in the middle, so we got, we dropped the hose and everything, and of course we got out of there oh. without any injuries. <laughs> wow. How but many How many guys? That was about four or five guys? There were three of us on the hose. Oh, three of you. And we were going to give her everything we had inside there. Yeah, yeah. I can remember that day so plain. Ooh. And I spent the entire day up there at that farm up there. And uh, I said, uh, there's the Sch Mrs. Schnell, I mean, Kenny Schnell's house that time. I spent another entire day up there. Wow. That, and that we needed so much. We pumped up pond dry, and then the way truck come from the dairy, and they took the way from that truck <laughs> and poured it in to that house to you. Oh, my. So God. we used a lot of water and we, <laughs> and we got uh, most of the fire out. Okay. And not, uh, we had an awful lot of damage in that house. Oh, yeah. And uh, the, the bottom part was damaged too, but not as much as the upstairs part. Okay. But um, well, um, I can remember uh, the Rutherford fires and uh, okay, you were there Cyple too. fire down there at the feed mill. Okay. At, uh, anything Spring unusual Valley. at the Rutherford fire or anything unusual? Yes, I was uh, second one there, <laughs> and uh, Mr. Hansen, uh, the fuzzy. Uh, uh, fuzzy, okay. You got to give me a. I, I, Clarence. 
Clarence, Clarence Hanson. Thank you. He, he Thank was, you. Uh, I think, the si assistant chief at that time. He he came down with the pumper and he stopped right by the dam right away. Okay. And I went down with with the tanker, and I was gonna. We had a, a pump in the back of that tanker, and I started that up. But before I got it, I started it up, and then I went inside first before I really was gonna go. I was the only one there. Fuzzy wasn't there yet, and nobody else came. So I went inside the tavern, and I can't find no flames yet. Oh. But it, but it was all in between. The, he, he had remodeled so often, and it was all between the ceilings in oh, that really? place. So then finally, it broke loose up on top, and by that time, we had more help come in, come in and then we uh, was shooting water. And in the middle of this building, where I don't know if you got this one. From, uh, I don't know if the Rutherford pictures are here. Rutherford fire. I think they were on that board. Right? Okay, that's that's okay. Between the um, um, uh, hotel and the, the, the uh, swimming area, yeah, they had a swimming area over there. That's they had a, like a fire door, and guess what that fire door contained of? Press paper about it. Just closed it up. But the fire was all in the ceiling, and it shot all the way through. And myself and um, Tommy Kleckner, we were in the middle of this thing with the hose. Wow. And uh, the roof blew off, and it went up, Yeah. and it came down. By the time it went down, we were out. Oh, so Lord. we were fortunate there. So I said, after that fire, I was a nervous wreck for a couple of days. <laughs> I would say. I would but, say. Uh, I said, uh, I can remember every barn fire. I can remember every chimney fire. Oh. And when, when you drive that truck out to a fire, yep. and it's got flames in the sky already, then you know you're in for a good day. <laughs> and Curtis Myers, I don't know how many of you, any of you guys were there, none of you probably, his house burned. That was on a Saturday, and it was so doggone cold. It was so cold, everything froze up. And, Oh. And they're bringing this water, and I had a, I was with the pumper, and they were pumping this water, and the ice fo formed around us all over, uh, uh, around the hall area that was so slippery and everything. When we got the fire out, the upstairs, the hall roof, everything was shot, but the bed was still made, but there was a crystal ice over that bed. <laughs> <laughs> and what bothered me the most was they had an oil tank where they heated with oil that was in the basement. And we, we couldn't get into the basement because that tank was in front of the door. Oh my which God. Which shouldn't have been, but it was there. You find so many th different things when you get get into a fire. You go into one house, I went in with the hose and with my gas mask on, and I got into the basement, and here from one floor to the next, there was a little rise, and I tripped over that thing, oh. and there I laid again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I said you you uh, run into so many different things uh, as a fireman, and uh, I must uh, say I always take my hat off to anybody that's a fireman. We do too, sir. Yep. Yep. Thank you so much for sharing. Yep. Thank you. Side down, or the steps come down and be the east side. And what building is that again, Charlie? The front was the door was toward the front of the road, to the world. Really? Yeah. This is the first fire station. Oh, that's this the first fire? Oh, okay, gotcha, I'm sorry. Yeah. This is the same building. That's a building, yeah. And so that overhead door was facing... It's over here. Down to Washington Street. Yeah. So you're actually kind of looking northwest there. Mm -hmm. Right? That picture. Yeah. Go right ahead, please. I'm Kathy Sixel, and I wanted to know what happened to the sister that Keith spoke about before, where the... was built... Or it's underneath the firehouse, your second or third yeah. firehouse, second <laughs> firehouse. Um, okay, the, Keith. The, uh, Keith, you. <laughs> Thank you. The cistern was used up until the fire department moved out of that building a year ago. Okay. Um, in 2006. All right. The cistern did not fill as well as it had previously when the um, senior apartment building was built on North Maple. When that 
building was built, they must have hit some springs or drain tiles or something when the footings were put in for that building. Okay. And af after that, but after that building was built no. is when the cistern stopped filling as good as it did. It would, in spring it would fill. Okay. And when there was heavy rains, it would fill. But, like, we were having an extremely dry summer this summer. Yeah. Uh, that cistern, I'd be willing to bet, is empty right now. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Right in. Well, oh, identify. Take it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a correction okay. here. Okay. He says when that place was built in the backyard by me, they put they put in a, a sewer line, a storm sewer, a big one. Okay. And that that's running all the way through uh, Juniper Street. I mean um, Main Street all the way to the next street, plus down. I used to be able, in the backyard by me, I could say uh, I'm going to sell lick frontage because there was so much water, see? Yeah. And that's what the water would was filling. Would fill the system. But since they put this storm sewer through here, that eliminated oh. that. That must have been around the oh. same that time? Before, that was before they put these buildings up there. Okay, but it must right. have been shortly before that then. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Because they wanted good. to uh, drain that area. And, sure. And with that storm sewer through, through there, it uh, drained that area. Thank you. Kurt Brandt, who owns the firehouse, what was the firehouse right now, Yeah. he looked into using that cistern for heating and cooling that building, Oh. and it was determined that there was not enough water, continuous water flow in there to utilize that Okay. for heating and cooling the building, so right. he had to scratch that idea. Okay, now the person that occupies this building uh, that was the fire station, uh, his name one more time, and what did they use it for? His name is Kurt Brandt. Okay. And Kurt is using the part that was the truck bay where all the trucks were located yep. as storage for his construction business. Okay. And he is putting an apartment in on the east side of the building, what was the meeting room. Okay. All right. Very good. I would like to yes, sir. add one thing. Sure. Um, on, if you look at this... Up here. Okay, now we're looking at what up here? This is the bell tower. Yes, sir. And if there was a fire, either Harold or whoever got the call, we would run over there and they'd ring the bell. Okay. And then, well, I lived right uh, close by, and yep. the people that were close by are the ones that would hear the bell. Yes. So that's the only f fireman you got until Loretta would call everybody that around the village to come fight the fire. But and the who, only who is Loretta? Could you give her last name? Loretta Wimler. She was uh, the fire chief's wife. Okay. And and then later on we got modern, <laughs> and they put on up a um, siren. Okay. Fire okay. Up there. Then the, they blow the siren, and more people from the <coughs> village could hear it. Sure. And then if I was driving the truck, yep. I would blow the siren all the way through the village and all the way up because the people on top of the hill said we didn't hear the siren. <laughs> so if I blow that siren and keep blowing it, they didn't have any excuse why they didn't come. <laughs> but then that was when we, now they're really modern. Now they all have a little box beside themselves and and they can know, they know where the fires are. Okay. And it's really nice in the way that it works. Now. Jerry, I have a question. Sure, I'll pan right over to you, Kathy. Right ahead, I'm please. Kathy Sixel, and wasn't Mrs. Wimler really um, involved with the fire department real much after her husband died, Harold? She the calls yeah. came into that tavern, right? Right. Okay. Want to tell us a little about that? And I think when their fire was, the clock is down at the bank right now. That is when, how they determined when the fire started because that clock stopped. Okay. No, uh, Mrs. Go right ahead, sir. Mrs. Wimler was, as long as I can remember, even after Harold uh, wasn't more the chief, uh, she was still active, and even after he died, she was a very active uh, fireman. She could uh, write a lot of stories about being a, uh, about the Cleveland Fire Department. <laughs> and uh, she, she knew one thing, if we didn't know, she'd be there in the morning opening the doors up. And if we didn't know where the fire was, you know, the person where it was, she would tell you. She knew. <coughs> so there was one good thing about 
that, that she knew where everybody lived. And uh, well, I, at that time when I first came out of the service, well, I didn't uh, know that many people. Uh, you know, I lost contact with a lot of people. Okay. But uh, she knew where everybody was, and uh, it, it was a big help. And through the years, I'll bet you, even till the, until she died, practically, that she would be with the fire department when anything was going on. Well, great. I actually think that she would have, the, her family had to stop her from opening the doors, right? Yeah, because yeah. they were afraid that she would fall and get hurt. Yeah. So she, she would run over it. to the fire station and open the doors ahead. Open the doors. <laughs> and even start trucks if she needed to. She, had, she started the trucks too? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Well, again, I'll have a question for uh, anybody here who wants to, but I'll start with Mr. Bazine. Hold back me? Okay. One quick one here for me at this point. I believe, as you indicated, that the winter time is the worst time for fighting a fire uh, any time of the year, I guess. Well, these younger firemen have no experience with this, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> every year we run into at least a dozen chimney fires, once in a while, two, two, two at the same place the same year. And, uh, you know, like I said, it, Take my hat off to anybody to be a fireman. When you got to go and up that ladder, and then put another ladder to get up to that chimney, yep. and then you got to go up there and hang on to the chimney, and you got to pull this cord up and down a ch chain with a, oh. with a weight in there to knock all the sil uh, uh, <laughs> so stuff off the, the sides of the chimney, and then and I was made sure. I, was the driver, and then I went into the basement. I didn't have to climb up on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd pick out wash tubs full oh my gosh. of burnt stuff that came out of that chimney. Yeah, yeah. And that was us like red hot stuff. Wow. And then they'd take it outside and get rid of it. Wow. But uh, I said once in a while you had two, two times in the same place. They burned those green wood in their chimneys. Yeah. But, um, it, it's amazing that nobody ever fell off the roof. Yeah. You know, when it's slippery up there. And now the thing is, and I would be a novice here, and I think I'd screw it all up. Uh, to put a fire hose down the chimney is not the thing to do, right? No, you, you <laughs> meant you bust the bust, bust the chimney. But I brought it up to Harold Wimler once. There is a, a little red ball, a glass ball, okay. that you can go and go up there, yeah. or you can throw it right into your furnace. Okay. And this would suffocate the oh, fire. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. But then Harold says, then they don't have no heat for the rest of the night, but it would be better off putting that ball in there than having somebody going sliding off the roof. Of That's, the right. Yeah. That's right. And it's always those two-story buildings. They didn't have them <laughs> one-story buildings. Those they had them two-story buildings. So it, it was a... Did you ever, I know there's a question behind me, did you ever get injured at, at a scene or a fire scene? How was that? Or did you ever get hurt or injured? Well, no, I, I never got, on the Schnell fire, I, I fell through the floor and I was hanging there. Really? And I fell down in, uh, in between Bernie Chris and I had the gas mask on, they only had those little mask on. And I was hanging between the rafters, oh. and, and uh, between Bernie Kress and Francis Schmidt, they were holding me with the rope. I went in, and and uh, the, all of a sudden I went too fast, and, and they tried to pull back and they couldn't get me. And I was lucky enough that I had two husky guys. They come running in there and took a deep breath, and they got on her oh. shoulder, both arms. I think that's why I still got sore arms. <laughs> <laughs> Yanked me out of there and oh. got me out, and I was full of smoke. That oh, time that fire. Yeah. And I did pull leg muscles once by running over to the fire department okay. in the winter. <laughs> okay. But, uh, well, uh, I said uh, we've been pretty fortunate that we haven't had any yeah. casualties. Well, again, I thank you so much for doing your job for the village like that, and uh, I think a lot of people appreciate that. See, the pay was so good. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Right ahead, please. Paul Jacoby, I have a question for Keith. 
the one picture you got the trucks on Washington Street. When was that change out to the west door? There's a picture oh, that yeah. went through where the trucks were going off of south into out to Washington Street, and then later on when the addition was put on. They were okay. Uh, <laughs> again, Keith Kirby, <coughs> yes. um The could you state the question? The the question was when did it change from the trucks going out to Washington Street to the trucks going out onto Juniper Street? Okay. And that would have happened when the addition was put on to the firehouse, which was approximately 1976. Um, in 76, then there was a, an addition put on, and the trucks would go west onto Juniper Street and then out onto Washington. Prior to that, they would enter, go south directly onto Washington Street. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Victor Schill, I yes, want to know what year and how did it was off. Pumpers, old pumpers, and then get the Phoenix. Did nobody, anybody know when they went down there or what year? Or okay. When they were sent down there? All right. Good question. Thank you. I'll lead you in, sir. The gentleman will uh, present the question and the answer. Go right ahead. The question was, at what point were, was that equipment all taken to Phoenix, Arizona? And Kathy gave me... Uh, Clipping here, I'm not sure where she got it I got from. it from Kenny Brookshin, right? They were <laughs> down there. <laughs> and, and then I cut it out. And here it says that in 1956, museum founder George Getz Jr. found this um, ladder truck and that uh, the hose cart and the ladder wagon uh, in a barn near the site of Centerville, which no longer exists. He also acquired the town's old fire bell, which is on display just outside the entrance to the Hall of Flame. Okay. So evidently in 1956 is when this stuff was found and okay. must have been moved. Okay. And you had your own theory on how all this progressed to get to this Phoenix location. It, I believe... Someone had told me that some of this some of this equipment may have been located at the Firefighters <coughs> Hall of Fame in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Okay. And that at some point in time it moved from Kenosha to Phoenix. Okay. To the Hall of Flame. Okay. Very good. It's known down there. Thank you very much. Okay, got a gentleman here who has a plaque with him, and uh, he'd uh, like to tell us all about it. Go right ahead, please. I'm Willard Matthias. Thank you, Willard. After, when I retired from the fire department, they presented me with this flag, flag and it says on there, Word Matthias, an appreciation for many years of dedicated service, Cleveland Fire Department. What year would that have been? I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> and and I, they did give this to each one that retires. Okay. So there's a All few right. around. Okay. And they also gave me a cap this year. They give you a cap. Yeah, I don't know how come they get, must have had an extra one. <laughs> <laughs> Looks pretty good on you, Willard. You look about 20 years younger. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask a question of both of you. I think you probably are both involved in things like that. To raise funds to keep on going with your unit, what do you do to do that? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. I'm Willard. Besides, uh, Years ago, when I was uh, with the department, uh, we'd run a picnic. A picnic. And, of course, being uh, one of the younger ones, you got to be in charge right away. Oh, okay. So <laughs> we had these picnics at Wimler's Recreation Hall. Okay. And we'd hire Romy Gaz as the band. Okay. And we had the bar and uh, music. On a Sunday, this was just a one-day deal. Okay. And on, on a Sunday, they'd have these picnics at Wimler's. And the, all the firemen would be there to help, uh -huh. which was a good deal, you know. But uh, it really was a uh, big turnout from everybody. And this was about the only money that they really got. We didn't uh, have, uh, like... A lot of money at that time. Nobody did, but uh, the fire department could use that money, what they made from this uh, picnic, to buy stuff with those. And that's why it was a big success all the time. Okay. And, and I had uh, that picnic, and I had a uh, veterans picnic, and I went down to Milwaukee and bought all that.
carnival stuff, and we had um, bingo, okay. and we had to buy enough stuff for two picnics. So that was a big deal for me, for being the 1948 already, I was running down Milwaukee and buying all this stuff up, and I didn't know what to buy, but this guy from Howard's Grove, he came, he was with me, and he was telling me what Howard's Grove buys and stuff, and well, I just went down a little bit and didn't buy uh, as much stuff as he did because they were running a lot more bigger picnics. But uh, that's what we did. And we'd run a dance during the winter. Okay. And we'd um, have card parties. Oh, and really? All, this was all done at Wimler's Recreation Hall. So, uh, I mean, okay. this was our income. Okay. So then uh, later on when uh, we had uh, our firehouse and we started... There was too much work in having these picnics, so we had just a, a Saturday night picnic around the firehouse. Okay. We had a bar up there and fry and so, yeah. which was scaled down quite a bit. And then we'd ask all these people from around the village help us tend bar and and fry the brats and stuff. And and it was a good uh, evening on a Saturday night, and they'd be dancing in the firehouse. Okay. But. Uh, that was our, our income. But uh, I said, in those days, it was a lot harder to raise a dollar than it is now, it was now to, on the tax roll. And another thing, we, uh, when as firefighters, once a year we'd take our wives out for a party. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where, we, before we ever started, and somebody brought up that I suppose you're going to be using our tax dollar money for <laughs> for that. So what we did was <laughs> pay it our own way. Okay. So we had a party, but we each one could pay for what he was expected to pay for that night. So, I mean, those are held up at Tourist Inn. We have a dinner and have mm -hmm. our drinks and stuff. And, and uh, years back, after I got out of there, they had, the parties were a little wilder then. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we, we were more or less just a beer drinker. Okay. <laughs> but uh, later on, they, they hear that those parties got a little better. Okay. So. Well, very good. Thank you. The okay, gentleman had his hand up, and he'd like to identify himself and present a question, perhaps. Fred Jacoby. And they were talking before about how they let people know. Well, I don't know how they did it in the village, but I remember uh, out in the country, uh, the telephone fire alarm was five long because everything was, oh. they were, like our, our phone was two long and three short, and others had one long and three short or something, you know. And when five long rang, then you answered the phone and somebody was there telling you. Now, I don't know how that worked because our circuit would have been maybe eight parties. Yeah. So somehow they got the word out and that was one of the ways. Okay. I, I remember specifically, uh, in 1938, when Victor Stoltenberg's barn burned down, it was, uh, we were eating breakfast in the morning, 7.30 or 8 o'clock, and it was very dark and thunder and lightning, and the fire, uh, five long, went off. My father went to the phone, and I, I remember it so distinctly, and it's the only one I remember, uh, he said, barn fire, Victor Stoltenberg, and he was out the door. You know, really? Everybody, neighbors went to help, you know. Yes, yes. So I w maybe somebody can add more to that if that was how that worked. Okay, very good. Good memory thought there, sir. Thank you. Okay, go right ahead, please. <laughs> but you just let's see. Thank you. I when they were telling about six thousand dollars for one fireman, how many fire costumes or uh, turn out here. uniform uniforms do you have for how many firemen? Okay. He just said. It. He said. Right you now, right? How big? many? How many six thousand dollar outfits do you have? Thirty six. Okay. I okay. didn't get that if he said it before I didn't get it. Okay, thank you. Very good question. Okay, we got a young lady who had her hand up. Go right ahead, please. I'm Audrey Ertle. I used to work at the Cleveland Co op and I remember there was a a, a barn fire and it must have started like four or five o'clock in the morning or maybe six o'clock, I don't know. But anyway, when I came to work uh, after I had been at work, they talked. Uh, one of the men talked about there was a bill for uh, utter cream. Somebody had come in to the co-op 
yes. and picked up a bunch of buckets of utter cream because it was January and everything was freezing cold and they were smearing the utter cream on their face and on their hands. Really? And till in the summertime, there were uh, some people here from Chicago that wanted to buy a lot of utter cream because they heard about the firemen using utter cream in the wintertime. Okay. Wow. Very good. You very know what utter cream utter is. Utter cream is, that's for the cows. For cows', cows. udders. Yeah. So that they, <laughs> they, if they get sunburnt and so forth. Right. People, okay. But we sold a lot of utter cream that one year <laughs> after that barn fire because uh, they were using the utter cream uh, at this fire. It was yeah. January. It was t yeah. below zero and terribly cold. Whoever had the idea, it wasn't too bad, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Great idea. Thank you. Got a gentleman here. Had his hand up. Go right ahead, please. Richard Wiegand, I always have to say something. <laughs> um, the first thing is, I don't know if it's been covered, but uh, my understanding is that nobody was burned, any of the fire department people were burned or killed or injured seriously in the fire. That, yes, I... In the history of the fire department, but I know that Margaret <coughs> Miller Sr. died of a heart attack at a fire. And I don't remember where the fire was, somebody else could, could mention okay. it. The second thing I want to mention is, after your barn burned down, who did you call to rebuild your barn? And in most cases around here, I think it was Art Erbstazer. And there's a number of Erbstazer barns around or used to be around the area, and he had a distinct roof style. It's a gambrel type of, of a roof, and there's still a number of these barns around. This would have been in the probably the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Okay. So he was the master barn builder. I mean, there were other people too, yeah. but somebody's pointed out a number of these to me. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Got a gentleman has his hand up. Right ahead, please. Um, John Wiegand, on the very first picture that you had up tonight, and I don't know if you got it available. If, if not, that's fine, too. But um, I think <clears throat> you mentioned Thomas Hardware being next to uh, Wimler Tavern down there. I, I, From the age of the picture, I think that would have been Table Hardware. Well, Table at that time. Yeah. And oh, good job. Good job. I, Mention it because Tapel was, uh, as Walter mentioned, Tapel was the fire chief for many years, and later he sold to Thomas, and I, Thomas was also in the fire department. I don't know. Okay. So it was well, it was very handy for them. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, John. Thank you. Right ahead, please. Okay, I'm Audrey Ertle. I still worked at the co-op, and we had quite a few firemen that worked. And when they had oh. a free time, the firemen would get together and discuss, or you know. The workers would, would discuss with the firemen about different fires, and there I don't know when this fire was, but uh, there was a, a Mr. Lutzi that had a garage, a rep car repair garage across the street from the firehouse in Cleveland, and he had had an uh, accident, a hunting accident, and shortly after he had this accident, and he was home and getting better. There was a fire, and they couldn't get the fire truck started, so they went to get the blind man to start the fire truck. Ah, oh, that's right. He was blind, and he had the super knowledge in that. Right. Good job. Ed Lutzi. Ed Lutzi. I, Ed Lutzi. I knew he was a Lutzi, but I... Elmer? Okay. Elmer Lutzi. Okay. Very good story. Very good story. Thank you. We got a young lady who had her hand up. Go right ahead, please. I'm Alice Mathias. I'm just wondering if the new, uh, at the new location where the fire department is now, okay. if they missed the Wimblers. Between Vermelda and Polly and Loretta, they all, when the fire trucks went out, yes. they're always in the middle of the street directing traffic. Really? Right. Yeah. Could you give those names one more time? Vermelda would be Loretta's Wimbler's daughter. Okay. And her husband, Polly, that ran the tavern. Okay. All right. Yes. They would, when the fire sirens went off, they'd open the doors and they'd stand on the corner, direct the traffic. Wow. Fire trucks, which way to go and stop the traffic. Wonderful. And I'm just thinking that they probably missed that up on their new location. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Alice. Thank you. Good. We didn't know that. Okay. Uh, we have a gentleman here who is uh, the, the latest on the scene as far as a new location for the Cleveland Fire Department. Go right ahead, please. Keith Ruby, um, the... In 2006, the Cleveland Fire Department <coughs> purchased what was the Manitowoc County Highway Department on West Washington Street at 1274 West Washington, which borders Dairyland Drive. Okay. That is our current location. We renovated the building, um, 
made, upgraded the building, updated the building, put new heat in, insulated the building. Okay. Um, we are currently able to have all six of our vehicles in that building side by side. Each truck is able to leave that building without any other truck moving. Okay. Which we did not have at the previous location. Oh, okay. There is room between the trucks. We can walk between the trucks now. Yep. Um, it, in our previous location, it was extremely tight with six right. vehicles. We also renovated the meeting room side of that building. Okay. Um, it's it's a wonderful location for us. We're easy access onto Washington and Dairyland Drive, so it okay. was a good move. Okay. And you got training sessions for your crew at this we time? We have fire drills uh, two times a month on the first and the third Mondays of each month. Okay. We drill starting at 7 o'clock. The drill portion usually lasts until 9 at the earliest. Once in a while it gets to be 9.30 or 10 o'clock. Oh, okay. Um, we have meetings after that. Business meeting is always on the first Monday. Okay. And in addition, the first responders have drills twice a month as well. Those are on the second and fourth. Thursdays. When you say you have six uh, vehicles, is the first responders vehicles in there too? Yes, the first responders have one vehicle. Okay. Um, our rescue squad it, it houses our emergency medical service equipment. Okay. And then in addition to that truck we have two pumpers, uh, 1988 Pierce that pumps 1250 gallons a minute, uh, 1999, no it's newer than that, 2001. Uh, Freightliner chassis with a uh, pump on with the capability of pumping 1,500 gallons a minute. Oh. We have a 1981 GMC tanker truck that holds 3,000 gallons. We have a, nine, or a 2003 Freightliner that carries 3,500 gallons of water. And then we have our equipment van which carries our rescue equipment, our cascade system for filling the air bottles. Okay. Um, generators, uh, chemical or the, the oil oil dry. Yes, sir. Um, there are, is some gear on that truck. It has our airbags. Basic. It's our equipment van. It's mm -hmm. a way of getting additional equipment to the scenes. Okay. One final question. I think we might have to wrap it up. I know Willard mentioned that uh, years back, in order to keep the water supply handy for the trucks, the locals uh, brought their pickup trucks or whatever brought in 250 gallons or so. Right. Uh, is that still a thing that's happening or is that bygone? No, we we have, each of the pumpers has 1,500 gallons of water on it. Um, so between the two pumpers and our two tankers, we have 9,500 gallons of water on wheels at all times. Okay. And in addition, when we need, depending on the size of the fire, and we need assistance, we will call any neighboring departments for okay. help with hauling water or um, anything like that. Uh, just as an example, we pumped at the fire two weeks ago at the Wisconsin Box Company. Yes. At certain points in time, we were pumping 5,000 gallons a minute onto that fire. Wow. Um, it took us about a half an hour to use up the village water supply. We had 17 departments hauling water and we estimate that we use somewhere in the neighborhood of a million gallons of water on that fire. Really? Yeah. We we know for sure that we use 650,000 gallons of water without, that's not including what we uh, hauled out of Lake Michigan that night. And there were two tankers, or two pumpers filling tankers down at the boat landing at Lake Michigan okay. from approximately 8 o'clock until... Yeah, between probably 12.30 and 1 o'clock that morning. Well, well, I do thank you again, Keith, for a wonderful job. You were well prepared. You presented a lot of good information. We thank you for being the presenter this evening. You're and I'll, I'll pan this over to Kathy. We'll do our final uh, farewell here. Well, I think we should applaud our firemen who are here tonight for all the help they have given us all over the years. Thank you. And, and I uh, also want to thank Jerry O'Neill and his wife Beatrice and Charlie Bauer and his wife Cheryl 
Irene Dine and Eugene Moiser for all the help Saturday with the fry. Without them, it would not be possible. Right, right. So, thank you very much. Our next meeting will be September 11th, and it is going to be Bondi's Quick Mart. Okay. So. All right. And uh, we'll sign off at this point then. Kathy Sixel. Thank you very much. Charlie Bauer. And thank please you, save your fire person. <laughs> oh. Keep keep Droopy, assistant fire chief. Thank you. We're doing that. Okay. And. Willard Matthias. Did you have a distinction of uh, any kind of rank, sir? No. No? <laughs> you were a hard working fireman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and ma'am? Dolores Kress. Thank you, Dolores. <clears throat> Kathy Wagner. Thank you for coming. Joe Kress. Thank you, Joe. Walter Kress. Walter, thank you as always. Rick Byers, sir. Thank you, Rick, for coming. John Wiegand. John, thank you. And back row, please. Irene Dine. Thank you, Irene. Alice Mathias. Thank you, Alice. Richard Wiegand. Richard, thank you. And who do you have here again? Eugene Weiser. Eugene, again, my thanks for helping the other day. And who do you have here, please? Vernon Brookshin. Thank you, Vernon. Clarence Brookshin. Thank you, Clarence. Virginia Brookshin. Virginia, thank you. And the back row, please. Carl Ziegler. Thank you, Carl. Melvin Yeadie. Thank you, Melvin. Ray Bolin. Thank you. Victor Schill. Thank you very much. And who do you have here, please? Naomi Schmidt. Thank you again for coming. Dan Schmidt. Thank you for coming. Ellsworth Yeager. Thank you also for coming. Audrey Erdl. Thank you, Audrey, as always. Janet Miller. Thank you for coming. Edith Metzi. Thank you, Edith. Marie Pippert. Marie, thank you. Who are you here, Fred? Jacoby. Fred, thank you for coming. Paul Jacoby. Paul, oh, thank you. Andrew Pratt. Thank you for coming, Andrew. We appreciate you coming. I hope you do well in your history. <laughs> Thank you. Bonnie Crockett. Thank you for coming. And who do you have here, please? Ellen Palmeyer. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Milton Palmeyer. Milton, thank you for all your input there. We appreciate that very much. And this evening, this is Jerry O'Neill again from the videographer for the Greater Centerville Historians, and I guess we sign off for the evening. And thank you again to these gentlemen for doing a fine job.